One of the best American novels ever written pretty much by anybody's list that you might look at is Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Raise a hand if you've read To Kill a Mockingbird. Ah, oh, that's very encouraging. Uh, many in here have read To Kill a Mockingbird. And if you've read this classic, you'll remember a character named Boo Radley. Boo is a, a mysterious character in the book who uh, kind of only comes out at night. Uh, Scout and Jim and the, the rest of the children in the neighborhood are kind of terrified of Boo Radley. They tell all kinds of stories about him and the things that they've done. When they get near his house, they sprint full speed with their hearts pounding and trying to avoid being seen by Boo or uh, interacting with him in any way. However, by the time that you get to the end of the book, you come to understand much more about both Boo Radley's life as well as who he is as a person and his role in the novel itself. He's not really the boogeyman that everybody made him out to be. In fact, I won't ruin it for you, but he's something of the opposite of a villain in the story by the time you get to the end of the book. And there are a million stories like this. It's a common literary and film device where you have somebody who is thought to be a villain, thought to be a bad guy, who by the time you get to the end is not. And if a classic American literature isn't your thing, think old man Marley from Home Alone, the guy with the snow shovel who kind of saves the day in the end. So something for everybody. But, but in such stories, you, you wonder how the characters' lives would have been different if they would have seen the reality of who that person is, if they would have known that that person was something of a hero, if they would have known that that person wasn't uh, as scary as they, would, they were made out to be. How would that have changed their entire lives and their entire experience in the story? Well, we, we have something of that plot device going on in James chapter 1 this morning. James wants us to be careful. James wants us to be very careful, especially when it comes to trial and, and hardship and suffering and difficulty in our lives that we don't get the hero and the villain of the story twisted. Understanding the source of, of all blessing and understanding where all blessing comes from and understanding where temptation comes from, the right understanding of those two things are key in the Christian life. Understanding who the hero is and understanding who the villain is. We're going to be in James chapter 1 this morning, verses 12 through 18. James 1, verses 12 through 18. If you have a copy of God's word, make your way there main idea this morning is to trust our good God who tests but never tempts. Trust our good God who tests but never tempts. And James is trying to give us a perspective on our own story. And we're going to follow his argumentation through these three points. Number one, the story arc. Number two, the villain. Number three, the hero. Those are three points as we'll go through James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Number one, the story arc. Number two, the villain. Number three, the hero. Follow along as I read James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Blessed is the man who, may, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Trust our good God who tests but never tempts. The first thing we see here is the story arc, the story arc of your trials and indeed your life. 
I have in mind here mainly the, the first verse that we read there, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. This first verse uh, gives us the, the overview of the story, the, the narrative arc, the entire plot of the story of your trials. James is taking us from where we are right now with our experience of trials and zooming us forward and, and taking us uh, to where God is ultimately uh, directing us if we indeed stand firm in the midst of the trials of this life. And so he begins in verse 12 with the word blessed, blessed. Blessed is the man. If you're thinking that that sounds familiar to some of the stuff that Jesus said, you're right. And Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Jesus begins that Sermon on the Mount with a number of, of blessed statements, if you'll remember. And blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so on. James gives his own beatitude here. He said, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for, when, here's what he gets, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. I'll just make a note right here as you're reading, as we're going through the book of James, that's not the first time we're going to see an echo of the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, the Sermon on the Mount is littered throughout all of James' epistle. If you were here last week or listened to that sermon, you remember this is James, the younger brother of Jesus. And he is constantly echoing and reflecting on the Sermon on the Mount. If you have an ESV study Bible, you'll actually find a chart in your ESV study Bible that will show all of the connections between the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James. If you don't have that Bible, you can just Google it. Just search uh, James Sermon on the Mount and you'll find uh, very helpful ways to do that. It would be very encouraging. Even this week as we're looking at the book of James to take some time and, and, and line it up and compare it to what Jesus said in his sermon and what James is doing in his book. It's an encouraging uh, kind, of, kind of cross study there. But, but he said, blessed, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Blessed, or in this way of, of what is meant here in the Beatitudes, means that the, the person uh, who's blessed, so this person uh, the, the, of whom it says blessed, is the person who is living in such a way so as to enjoy God's favorable approval. That's what, how one commentary puts it. The, the person is living in such a way so as to enjoy God's favorable approval. The idea is that those in Christ both know God's word and live God's word, and, and, and so that they have a sense of joy, of happiness, because their experience of, of knowing God comes as a part of knowing Jesus' salvation and following Jesus' commands. So those who are truly in Christ, you both know him and then do what he says, those people are blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who remain steadfast under trial. Well, why is the person who endures trials blessed? It's because once he has stood the test, James says, meaning once this man or this woman has stood all of the tests that will come his or her way, in the end, James says, they will receive something. In the same way in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is saying, blessed is this person for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, for they shall see God. In the same way that they will receive something. Look at the text. Blessed is the man who remain steadfast under trials for he will receive the crown of life. Now, when we think of the word crown, we, we will typically think of what? Kind of a, a piece of metal that has jewels and stones, uh, very expensive, that would be put on somebody's head, uh, this gem-studded piece of metal. But that isn't likely the crown that James has in mind when he uses the word crown. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for he will receive the crown of life. He doesn't have in mind a piece of metal with gems on it. Rather, in, in this time, in this culture, in this place, what he probably had in mind was a, 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 a laurel wreath that was given to victors of athletic competitions. So, so if somebody uh, won some sort of an athletic competition, they were, they were given a crown, which was this, uh, this kind of laurel wreath thing that they would put on their head, and it was a reward. It was, it was kind of the trophy. It was the medal of the day. It was the reward for those who won the athletic competition. 
You, you might think of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, where Paul says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So that's the crown that is likely in mind here. And James calls it the crown of life. The crown of life. Blessed is the person who remains steadfast under trials, who bears up, who endures when all kinds of trials come their way. Blessed is that person for they will receive the crown of life. Now we're not meant to read that as if the, the, the crown of life were a proper noun. Right? So, so you, you know, somebody in here may get the crown of life. Somebody in here may get the crown of faith. Somebody else may, may get the crown of martyrdom. Somebody else may, may get the, uh, the, the crown of peace. No, it's not how we're meant to read this. The, the, the crown is life. The reward is life. So when James says, blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial, the person who endures all the suffering and hardship and pains and struggle that comes in the Christian life, the person who remains steadfast, like we looked at last week, the person who does that, blessed is that person because they get a reward. What is the reward? It's life. It is eternal life. It is true, abundant Life, that is the reward that we receive, is life. Now listen, that doesn't mean that Christians in any way earn their salvation, even through their own endurance. Endurance isn't a work whereby Christians build up merit to deserve God's favor. That, that's not the teaching here. Rather, true believers are those who will persevere through pains and thus prove that they genuinely belong to Jesus. So it's not that we earn God's favor and earn God's salvation through our steadfastness and through our endurance, but it's that we prove we are the ones who actually trust in him. We prove that we are who we say we are by the fact that we stick, have a stick to have, have an endurance, have a steadfastness with him. We prove the character of who we are. We don't earn the position that we have. A couple cross-references here that I'll give, and these are really helpful. Listen as I read these to the, the way that endurance factors into your salvation. Listen to this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not have, or they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. Right, you see, you see, well, how do you know those people w weren't ever saved? Well, because they wandered away, because they didn't endure. Well, wait, does endurance earn their salvation? No, but they proved by their lack of endurance that they weren't actually Christ to begin with. It's 1 John 2, 19. Here's another one. Same idea when Jesus tells the parable of the sower. The parable of the soils in Mark chapter 4, Mark 4, 17, we see seed that is thrown on different kind of soils, and there's a certain seed that falls on rocky ground. Mark 4, 17 talks about or these are those who have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. So don't endure all the way to the end, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately fall away. So they prove by, by the falling away of the lack of endurance that they did not have the true root in Christ. Church, just take this as a reminder. Again, James is giving the story arc, the entire story of the trials that we now face and connecting that to what, what does this mean for us for eternity? And as we saw last week, what trials do in our lives is trials uh, have, have a way of proving our faith because when we endure trials that builds character in us and when we see that character that we're not bailing and jumping ship, we, 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 that builds a hope in us, a hopeful in us that we really are kept by Christ. We really are who he says we are. And so James is rehearsing, is continuing to tell that story and, and take that as a reminder, church, that your entire story matters. Not just the beginning of it. The Christian faith isn't about just raising a hand at the end of, a, of an altar call or coming to the front. The, the Christian faith isn't about, about signing a card at some point. Or, or, or saying that I, I prayed a prayer after somebody. That is not the story of the Christian life. 
That may be a beginning of somebody's story, but that is not in any way how any of us have assurance in our life and our, and our walk with Jesus. Which is why life in the church is so vitally important. One of the reasons. There's many reasons why life in the church is so vitally important. But life in the church is so vitally important because the way that we get from where we are now with all of our trials to that day, the crown of life, the the reward that is eternal life, the way that we get from here to there is by us helping each other in that direction. That's the way that it happens. Your assurance of salvation doesn't rest on what you said way back when you were seven. Your assurance of salvation rests in what we see now. Your your assurance of salvation, the Bible doesn't promise that, 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 well, how do you know you're really saved? Well, did you pray a prayer one day? Good. That's not what the Bible says for assurance of salvation. Our our assurance comes because of the, the goodness and the faithfulness of the object that we trust in, and we show that we are uh, truly trusting in Christ by our consistent, constant endurance with him. And and again, we're all going to sin. Our our, our line from here to glory probably doesn't look like this. It it kind of looks like, looks like this, but as we don't just kind of take our spiritual temperature every day and say, man, I'm worse than I was yesterday. No, we we take a step back and we see that we are uh, progressing and following the Lord and pushing through trials and sufferings and, and all of these things that, that God uh, uh, will, will test our faith through in our lives. And James says, you look at that and the one who endures, blessed is the one who endures because he will receive the crown of life. It doesn't earn our salvation, but it proves that we are truly his. One more note here on verse 12. Again, this reward is eternal life, the crown of life. Know what it says it is, is that which God has promised to those who love him. Which clues us in on the fact that James doesn't have in mind here some sort of a, a level system or a gradation of, of blessing. You know, the, those who do a really good job of enduring are going to get this crown of life. And those who do like an okay job of enduring are going to get a dirty look. <laughs> That, that James doesn't have that in mind here. He said, oh no, who are those who get the, the, the crown of life? Who are those who get the reward of eternal life? It's those who love him. It's all who love him. Those who truly love and cherish Jesus and show that through a lifetime of enduring and sticking with him and abiding in Christ. Those who do that, those are those who love him. He has less in mind something that, that we're earning here and more of a maintaining of a relationship Isn't that so encouraging? What what we are doing here and what we see in this passage, it is so relational. We're not working to earn a piece of metal. Rather, we're maintaining a relationship. We are continuing to love our Savior. We love him and we keep loving him even through our trials. We keep abiding and keep standing firm. And those who love him will receive the reward of life with him. Just to see this, flip real quick just to the next book in your Bible, 1 Peter. See how familiar this sounds. So we're in, in, in the book of James. Next book is the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Remember the crown of life to those who love him. Listen to 1 Peter 1 verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though, for, uh, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Sound familiar? James saying that we count it all joy when we face various trials. Peter, very, something very similar. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though, get this, what does that endurance look like, right? So just like James 1, you go through trials now and you rejoice because they test the genuineness of your faith. It all leads through endurance to the crown of life. Well, what does that endurance look like? Look at verse 8 in 1 Peter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, 
you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is what endurance looks like. The good news of Christianity is not that we have to earn anything. It's not that we can earn anything. The good news of Christianity is that Jesus gave his life to make us friends with God. Forgiven, born again, regenerated, made new, new creatures. And because of that, we keep on loving him. Because of that, we keep on obeying him. Because of that, we keep turning to his word and saying, God, show me wonderful things from your word that I might, I might follow you and I might obey you and I might live my life as a disciple of Jesus. We keep loving. We keep believing. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do, you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So let me just say, if, if you're one of the, the younger folks in here, one of the, the kids here at Del Rey or one of the youth at Del Rey, you have a lifetime in front of you of living out this passage. There are going to be so many trials that come your way. And what James is saying is, friend, it is all worth it. It is all worth it. You have a lifetime of trials and suffering and people making fun of you for your faith and people trying to uh, uh, counteract what the Bible is telling you is true and people trying to redefine who God is and what he's like and what it looks like to follow him. And James says, that is all coming your way. Keep, you, though you do not see him now, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you keep believing in him. And it is entirely worth it. Those who endure through those trials, and listen, if you're younger in this congregation, you have a lot of trials coming. But it is worth it. And in the end, Jesus will give you a reward and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You get the reward of eternal life. And if you're on the other end of that age spectrum, let's call you seasoned. Friend, your reward draws near. I'm not looking at anybody. I don't want anybody coming up after. Are you looking at me? Your reward draws near. It is worth it. Though you do not see him now, you will one day soon. Keep loving him. Keep pursuing him. Keep enduring through your trials. Your trials may be intensifying right now. Keep enduring and clinging to him through those trials. And you will receive the reward of eternal life. Not that your endurance earns it, but your endurance proves that you truly is. Keep clinging to Jesus. It's worth it. So th that's the story arc that James is laying out here for us. That, that, that's the story of how we get from where we are now with, with, with our experience of our sufferings and our trials to where God is taking us in them. But then he wants to clarify two things. And those are our next two points. He wants to clarify who the villain is and who the hero is. All right, so point number two, the, the villain of the story here. Look again, if you're still in Peter, go back to James. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So again, James has, has talked quite a bit, uh, quite a bit about, about trials and, and about uh, testing, both in last week's passage, the first 11 verses and now in verses 12 and following. And, and he's talked so much about trials and testing that it seems like he, he feels like a clarification is in, is in order. After he's talked about trials and testing, he says, all right, guys, now let no one say... So given everything that I've talked about with trials and testing, let nobody say the following. Let nobody say this, he begins in verse 13. Because someone could potentially misinterpret the data here, misread the situation of what he's talking about. James wants to talk about the difference between, between trials and temptations. So he's talked all the, about trials and he says, no, 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 let's not get this twisted because I know you've got various things in your life. You have trials that come on and you have sin in your life. Don't confuse those two things. Don't confuse the trials that God is using to test your faith with temptation that the deceiver is dangling in front of you to try to lead you astray. Don't confuse those two things. 
And so verse 13, don't say that you're being tempted by God. God doesn't tempt anybody. Well, how do you know? Well, the explanation, if you look at verse 13, is this. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Do you see the logic there? It's that, that God cannot be tempted with evil, meaning he's, he's sinless. He's perfect. God cannot be tempted with evil because he's perfect, he's sinless, and to tempt somebody with evil is an evil act. And so we know that God would never tempt anybody because he's too perfect, he's too holy, he's too good, he's sinless. It would be wrong to tempt somebody with evil, and because we know God is tempted by no evil, he could never do wrong, and so God never tempts anybody. That's the logic that James is using there. You know God isn't tempting you because he can do no evil. And so, friend, if you're looking for a villain in the story of your trials and temptations, don't look God's way. Don't look his way. He is not the one who is tempting you. But, verse 14 begins, look at verse 14, James will help us see the culprit. If it's not God, then our misery and temptation comes from another place. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Whereas God is perfectly sinless, we are sinful. To understand this, we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden where our first parents chose disobedience to God and sinned. And if you remember back in Genesis chapter 3 when that happens, the language is the language of desire. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. When Eve, this is what it says, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes... And that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. That is the story of all of our sin. We see something, we want something, we take something. That, that's, that's, uh, the story is old as sin itself. It is wrapped up in our desires. Satan provided a deceitful alternative to the good commands of God. And being deceived, Adam and Eve gave in to their desires. This is what James chapter 1 verse 14 is portraying as well. The, the, the words that James actually uses here in James 1 14 are actually from the world of fishing. These are fishing terms that he uses. And, and the same way that a fish is caught whenever there's bait on a hook or bait in a net. In the same way, that's what it's like. Uh, the, the fish is enticed and, and lured in by something shiny or something tasty. And James says, we do the exact same thing. Adam and Eve did the exact same thing. Our temptations come not from God, but when we are lured and enticed by our, by our own desires. As a friend of mine likes to say, following your heart is the problem, not the solution. And our, our, our culture, our, we want to say the exact opposite, that following your heart is the way to true life. And James is saying, friend, it's not. It's not. We are all led astray into sin when we are lured and enticed by our own desires. But it gets worse. Verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So once we have that, that tasty desire dangled in front of us and we say yes to it, we say, yes, that, that's what I want. That, that's the thing that I've been craving. That's the thing that will truly give me life. James said there's a, there's, a, there's a conception that happens there. There's an implantation of something in our hearts that then gives birth to sin. James, he, he's a master of all illustrations all the way through this book. He's, he's pulling illustrations from every kind of a arena that you can think of. And he switches mid-argument from fishing to, to, to giving birth. He goes from a, a fishing metaphor to a, a pregnancy metaphor. Once we take the bait, we are impregnated by that desire and it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it, it's born and it is fully grown, James said, it will kill you. That sin allowed to march on unfettered, that sin allowed to, to, to progress with us not battling against it, with no repentance and turning from it and fighting against it. If that happens, that sin in your life will slay you. Now, Garrett has a, a great article, again, you can find online. 
uh, about imagining the end of your sin. As Gary likes to say, sin always hides the price tag. It never shows us what's going to happen there. Well, James is saying, listen, I'll show you what's going to happen. It's going to kill you. If, if, again, not just any sin. We all sin. We'll all sin today most likely. But, but, but sin that we don't turn from, sin that we don't repent of, sin that we're not fighting against. That, if, 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 if James says, if, if that's allowed to fully grow, if that, that, that sin is born once we give in to the desire and that sin is born, and if it is left to fully grow without us turning from it and clinging to Jesus, it will take us out. It will kill us. So you see the process here. You, you see how temptation works. It's not God, James is saying. God's not the one who's doing it. It's us. But we, before we move on, I, I think it would be helpful for us to consider a few thoughts of, about pushing back against this process of temptation. Because I, I don't think that we're, James is giving us this information just as kind of a fun mental exercise. Right, James isn't giving us this to, to settle our intellectual curities, uh, curiosities, right? Oh, that's how sin works? Cool. It's good to know, James. That's not his point. No, or, or even merely to get God off the hook. That God isn't tempting you. It's desire and you latching onto that that produces death. Oh, God's not guilty? We are. Great. Good to know, James. I, I, I think there's, we're meant to do more with this text than just that. I think part of the beauty of these verses is that they give us the enemy's game plan and allow us to come up with our own. Right, so, so we see, he says, this is how it works. This is how temptation works. David Platt, pastors here in the area, he, he summarizes verses 14 and 15 with these four words, which I think uh, really capture the, the progression that James is after. So deception, desire, disobedience, and death. So deception, desire, disobedience, and death. That's the progression. So church, think about fighting your own sin for a second. We almost always enter into the fighting of our own sin in the disobedience part, way down the line. And so we see a sin and we say, well, I want to stop that sin. Let me, let, me, let me put walls around that sin. Let me, let me bring other people in to talk about that sin. Let me, let me get accountability on that sin. I don't want to do that sin. I hate that sin. I don't want to do that. And let me, let me just try to get rid of that sin in my life. Well, according to James' progression here, James says, well, I see why you'd be frustrated. I see why that's not working. Right, we look, why can't I stop sinning? Why can't I stop doing this thing? Why can't I stop saying that? Why can't I stop looking at that? Why can't I stop believing that? Well, James says, you're, you're, I think he would say you're starting too far down the line. To use James' illustration, that's like going into a maternity ward and screaming, why do all these babies keep appearing? Right, James says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That's where we have to begin our battle. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The great Puritan John Owen wrote, wrote a book uh, just called On Temptation. And, and, and in this uh, great work on, on temptation, he says, He hates not the fruit who delights in the root. You got that? He hates not the fruit. So... The person hates not the fruit who delights in the root. Owen argues, he says, we can't say that, when, that we hate sin if we also don't hate the temptation towards our sin. The two are too nearly allied to be separated. And so in your own, whatever the sins are, are most prominent and prevalent in your life, and are fighting against those sins, we must go back a first, to the first couple stages. And so if you think of Platt's four stages that he summarizes there, we can, we can, we can uh, think about that. How do you wind back the clock on your common sins and, and think about uh, deception and desire? Again, whether you tend to sin most commonly with your speech, with your eyes, with your attitude, with your belief, with your action, we have to fight at the deception level. What lies are you believing? What's the baited hook? 
What is it about this thing that you, uh, that you tend to say? What is it about this thing you tend to believe? What is it about this thing you tend to look at? What is the lie? Where in there are you saying, I, I know God's word says this, but I'm going to choose to believe otherwise. We are being deceived with each and every sin. What's the lure and the deception? What's the enticement? God has given us his word. He has told us what is good. The reason we have commands in God's word is not because he's a buzzkill. The reason we have commands in God's word is not because he's trying to ruin your joy. The reason we have commands in God's word is that he knows we always tend to pursue pleasure through paths of pain. And he's saying, listen, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not trying to box you in. I just know, I know you, and I know you're going to pursue joy in the wrong way. Here's a command. Stop doing that. Again, the Bible has no problem with, the Bible is grace, 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 grace. Now stop doing that and start doing this. That's why God gives us his good commands, because we are so easily deceived about where the good life is found. So we start with our, our, uh, the level of deception. What, what lies are we believing that, of w- what our sin is truly going to give us or fulfill in us? And then we fight at the desire level. What, what, what is going on in my heart behind that sin that is being birthed? I'm choosing that sin because it, 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 on some level, at some point, it feels like life to me. It feels like joy to me. And so we fight at that level and say, not, not, just, not just, yeah, I, I've got a problem with gossip. But say, no, no, why do you have a problem with gossip? I have a problem with slander. Okay, but why do you have a problem with slander? When we sin with our speech, it's it's most often because we, we we feel a desire to put other people underneath of us. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Why is it? What what is it about going on in your heart that you feel the need to put other people underneath of you? What, What is that desire there? And then how does Jesus meet that? desire? How does Jesus actually fulfill and give life in those areas? And I, I, I want to put other people underneath of me so that I can get ahead. And Jesus says, listen, the, the, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. I'm bringing an upside down kingdom here. It's not the way that you think it's going to be. Whenever we struggle with anger or, or maybe putting other people down, we, we want vindication now and we want to bring it ourselves. Colossians 2 says, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if you have a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And so we say, I want to stop being angry so much, and we need to wind that clock back. Well, what is it that I'm believing, and what is it that I desire that actually springs out in anger in my life? If we're sinning visually or, or with, with immorality in the things that we look at or the things that we do with our bodies, well, what is it? What, what, is, what, is, what, is the, what is the deception there and what is the desire there? I, I think what's going on is that we're distrusting in God's good timing for fulfillment in our own lives. We're distrusting his, his plan, his ways. It's an impatience in us. The distrust that God's actually going to give me what I need when I need it. So just asking the question, why do I feel the need to take now what God has promised for me later? Or promised to fulfill in a completely different way. And we turn to God's promises. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's true desire fulfilled is seeing God, not immediate gratification now. And we could go on and on. Our own anxieties. Anxieties that we feel sometimes are, are, are fueled by our constant feeding of uh, ourselves of information. I'm going to read every single uh, thing I can about political policy that's going to make me kind of agitated and anxious about something. I'm going to read every single crime statistic that I can get my hand on and it fuels anxiety in my life. I'm going to read every article about coronavirus I can and it starts to feed anxiety in my life. It's our own control we feel that if I, if, I, if I have enough knowledge, I can control and I can move forward. And maybe, maybe that's what my desire is right there. And Jesus says, seek my kingdom and my righteousness and I'll take care of the rest. So friends, I, I don't know, there's just a few examples of ways in our lives that, that we uh, commonly struggle with sin. And if we're just looking at, I want to stop this sin, that's not going to happen. 
We need to wind it back and see how we're being deceived, what we're truly desiring, and then where is Jesus in that picture? How does he help us fight that sin? The villain is the deceiver who lures and entices us. And in a fallen world, our own flesh is the the villain where we desire those temptations and bite down on them. And James, as he's walking us through the story arc of how we're experiencing trials now to where God is taking us in eternal glory, he's saying, don't get it twisted. God isn't tempting you. God isn't tempting you. That's, that's us responding to the deceit and showing our desire for the things of the flesh. Well, now James is going to say, okay, so, so that's, that's the villain. Let me, let me show you who the hero is then. Verses 16 to 18. Do not be deceived. So again, in, in the same way that he uh, said earlier, let, let no one say, right? He's trying to correct. And he's also trying to correct in verse 16. No, let, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every perfect gift and every, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We've seen the story arc. We've seen the villain. Here's the hero. Similarly, again, how, how he began earlier with, with let no one say. He's saying here, do not be deceived. He sees potential landmines all around the landscape there and how we're viewing trials and temptations. He wanted no one to say that God tempted anyone. And now he wants his readers to not be deceived about the goodness of God. He is the hero. And the first, things that, the first thing that James establishes here, he establishes a, a number of just beautiful things about who God is and his character. But the first thing that he establishes is that, that our creator God gives good gifts. Our creator God gives good gifts. Look at the beginning of verse 17. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights. To say that, that he is the, the father of lights means that he's the one who created the lights. If you go back to uh, the creation narrative in, in Genesis, he is the one who created the lights. He's the one who created all of the stars. He's the one who created the sun and the moon and the galaxies and all the planets. He's the father of lights. He has created those things. And the fact that it calls him the, the father, it means that he's the, the, the source, the originator, the creator, the father of lights. In the book of Job, when we see God answering Job by firing off a bunch of questions back and forth. Job, where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? Job 38, 28. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? God is the, the father of all creation. And it points to his, his sovereign creativity and his power and his goodness. He's the father of all creation. And in James 1, 16, it says he is the father of of lights, meaning the creator of the sun and moon and stars. He's the origin of all creation. All good gifts come from above, from him. Now this is why it's common practice for for Christians to to pray before they eat a meal together. Jesus, we see in scripture, uh, praying and he, he, he broke bread and he gave thanks. And Christians have done that ever since. Listen, we're not praying for our food. Right, when we're, you know, you've got the double bacon cheeseburger with fried onion rings, and we're like, God bless this to the nourishment of my body. Right, that's, that's not the way it works. Uh, it doesn't, he doesn't turn that into broccoli in your stomach. That's not how he does it. And so whenever we're praying before a meal, we're not praying for the food. We're saying, God, this food didn't put itself here. God, thank you for your provision. Thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you that, that, that I, I, this just always keeps happening. You keep providing for us. You keep giving food to us. So this food didn't put itself here. You did. Thank you for your provision. You give good gifts. And church, I, th- I think the, the, the challenge for us, uh, especially for those of us who often pray before a meal, the, the challenge for us is how do we view God that way? Not just before we chow down, but in all of life. How do we see him as the God who, who gives every good thing? 
Not just our food, but, but, but uh, the relationships we have, the church we have, the life we have, the job we have, the, the, the everyday conversations, the free time we have to engage in something, the, the, just everything that he puts in our lives to look to him and say, God, thank you. Everything that I have, even my trials. James is saying, rejoice, count it all joy earlier in chapter 1 that you face various trials because God is doing something in it through it in your life. So how do we look at God through that? Not just saying thanks for the burger, but saying, God, thank you for even for the trials that you bring in my life. Thank you for that difficult relationship that I have at work. Thank you for the season of parenting that is just hard. And I don't see a light at the end of, t- of the tunnel right now. But God, I-, I thank you because I know you are good and you only give good gifts to your people. And so if you're giving this to me, it must be good for me in some way. I trust you with that. We are meant to, to, to look and experience our relationship with him in, in that light, in that way. So that's the, the, the first thing that we see that James is establishing here when we're looking at the heroes that our creator God gives good gifts. The second thing is that our creator God gives good gifts and doesn't change. Our creator, God, gives good gifts and doesn't change. Look at the rest of verse 17. He is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So so what James is saying is that he created the sun, but he's not like the sun. He created the heavenly bodies, but he's not like the heavenly bodies. He created the lights. He is the father of lights, but he doesn't change like the lights do. The fancy theological term here that I think is worth knowing is the word immutable. Immutable. God is immutable. God doesn't change. God is unchanging. And the, 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 the lights uh, will create a shadow that, that's long at the beginning of the day, and then as the sun goes, the shadow uh, shortens, and then it passes midday, and the shadow lengthens again. And James says, God does not change like that. He's not like a shifting shadow. He's not like a, a shadow that the lights will create that will vary. He is unchanging. Now, this, this might bring up some questions. As you think of Scripture, you might think, well, what about that one passage over there where it said God changed his mind? What about this passage over here that says it, it appears that God was going to do one thing and then he did another? Well, each of those situations, I, I think context is key. And so if you have those, I'd love to read through those and talk uh, through those together. But the context will determine what's going on in each of those passages. In one sense, what God is doing is is accommodating language to us. So something that looks to us like God is changing and and the the, the language of of God changing his mind or relenting or or something like that is used. But realize that that God knows the whole story. He knows the end from the beginning. And so we we see often in the prophets, Garrett's preaching through the book of Amos right now. And God is saying uh, to the nation of Israel, he says, "If, if you don't repent, judgment's coming. And then, then we'll see people often repent and, and God changes his mind and doesn't bring the judgment. Oh, wait, is God changing there? No, he wanted them, them to repent the whole time. Listen, if God wanted to judge somebody, what would he do? He'd judge them. If God wanted to, to bring uh, fire and brimstone, what would he do? He would do it. He do, that's not his desire. That's not what he wants. And so he brings prophets to warn his people so that they might turn from their sin. He gives us his word to warn us that he might turn from his sin. And then when he does, it says, well, God relents. God changed his mind about that. But it's not that God is not changing in his nature. He's not fluctuating like shifting shadows do. God is immutable. He doesn't change. Our creator God gives good gifts and he doesn't change. Now, let me just pull back the curtain just for a second because this is fun for me. I mean, pull back the curtain just for a second on some theological truths. Understanding God's unchanging nature is a beautiful truth, not just because it enables us to understand this one aspect of who God is, but because it helps to explain all of his attributes. Think of it this way. The Bible says that God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. The way that we can understand that God is all-knowing is because God is immutable. God doesn't change. If God ever grew in his knowledge or lessened in his knowledge, he would not be all-knowing. And we couldn't trust him. 
the wisdom that he gives us today, we wouldn't be able to trust because, well, you didn't know the whole thing anyway. You change in your knowledge. No, God's unchanging nature, the fact that he doesn't shift like a, like a shadow, actually gives us confidence that God is all-knowing, that he, he knew the end from the beginning, that the wisdom that he gave us in his word way back when this was written is still the wisdom that governs our lives right now because he never changes. God's unchanging nature tethers his omniscience. God's unchanging nature, the same thing with his omnipresence. God is everywhere. He's all present. He's not res restricted by space or time. To occupy only one space and one time as we do shows that we are limited. And, and then we, we, we change as we move throughout space and time. God isn't like that. He doesn't change. He is omnipresent pre precisely because he's immutable, because he doesn't change. If God changed in that regard, he would cease to be God and he couldn't be trusted. He could be tricked. He could be unaware. He could be late. He could be overwhelmed. But that's not the way he is because he is unchanging and he is all, he's omnipresent. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. He doesn't grow in strength or decrease in strength. Again, if he did, he could not be trusted. He could potentially lose control. He could fall to a foe. He could release his grip on you and me. But God can be trusted because he's all-powerful. And his unchanging nature tethers and, and defines his all-powerfulness. And just think, of, just think of any attribute. We don't have to go through all of God's attributes. But think of God is all, he, he's holy, he's completely holy, he's completely just, he's completely loving. And if he changed, all of those things would go out the window. All of those would be gone. Well, he's, he's just, but he changes. Well, how do you know his, his standard of justice isn't going to change as well? How do you know he, he punishes wicked uh, today and he's not going to do it later? Well, he's all loving. Well, yeah, but he's loving today, but maybe not tomorrow. Do you see what a beautiful doctrine this is of God's immutability, of God's unchanging nature? It is the thing that is the glue for all of God's attributes. And so James, when he's trying to encourage these people through their trials, say, listen, God's not the villain, God's the hero. He is the good God, the father of lights, who gives good gifts to his people, meaning anything in your life right now, God is going to work for good. Doesn't mean everything is good, but God is going to use everything for good. He's the father of lights who does that, and you know what? He doesn't change, so you know that you can trust him. He's not a shifting shadow. He is immutable. He doesn't change. And that causes us to rejoice in his steady, angered, unchanging nature and his goodness towards us. Finally, kind of in this section, how do I know that he's good? Well, finally, our creator God gives good gifts. He doesn't change. And then he's already giving us, given us the greatest gift. So it's our, our good God who gives good gifts he doesn't change, and he's already given us the greatest gift. That's how he's proven his goodness ultimately to us. Look at verse 18, the last verse in our text. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will. Meaning, he is the cause. He is the prime mover. He is the sovereign actor. Of his own will, he brought us forth. Not of our own will, but of his own will. He brought us forth. Christians commonly talk about being saved, but what we're really talking about is God of his own will regenerating us, making us new, recreating us, giving us a new birth, giving us new hearts, causing us to be born again. God, of his own will, brought us forth by the word of truth. Why does James bring that up right now in this argument? Because that is the greatest gift God could give us. Not the insecurity of us working for our own salvation. Not the insecurity of us trying to be good enough and give God an assist where he could kind of come down and meet us halfway and save us. No, the best gift that God ever gave us, this good God, father of lights who doesn't change, is for him of his own will, which doesn't change, which can't go back, which can't uh, lose anything that he's started. He will complete all that he started. That good God of his own will caused us 
to be born again, brought us forth. That, friends, is good news. That is good news. That is the gospel of Christianity, the good news that, that, that we, the, those sinners that we see right here, we, we saw in our second point, the, uh, the, the sin that infects us and, and how sin uh, ultimately brings forth death, that our Savior, Jesus, entered into that and, and took that death for us in our place as our penalty. That our death falling on him, that if, if we believe that, that, that he truly is the Savior who was the substitute, the sacrifice in our place, the Bible says that if we trust that, we believe that, that we have eternal life. God has brought us forth by the word of truth. That's the gospel. This is the ultimate good that's been done to you. By his will, what more proof do you need of his goodness? And he's not only done it to you, but he's done it for many. And that's what that last phrase means. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The shepherd has more sheep to gather. And we are just the beginning. James says, you want to talk about goodness. <laughs> so you see the story. James is talking to us about our trials, about our pains in this life. And he's saying, church, endure trials, remain steadfast. And if you do, there's a reward of eternal life. That's the story. And in the middle of that story, there's going to be temptations. That's not God. That's not God. That's Satan tempting you and deceiving you and your own fallen flesh that desires those things and takes it. And that's going to bring forth death. But also in that story, of trials to receiving the crown of eternal life. Also in that story, there's a hero. And it's Jesus. It's God by his own will bringing you forth and giving you every good gift so we know that he can be trusted. So in the story of your trials, you know that God is good and he's unchanging and he's proven that by giving you Jesus so that you may have eternal life. The point of this passage and really all the way from the beginning of verse 1 up to where we are right now is to, to, to show the church that Christ is a sure and steady anchor. The, the down payment on that goodness was his body and his blood given for us that we'll celebrate here just in a few moments. It is reorienting our thinking to see that and to remember God is a good God who gives good gifts to his people. He can be trusted. He never tempts us though he tests us to purify and fortify and prove our faith so that we have hope in the life to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the work of Christ that we celebrate here at the Lord's table, the body and blood of Jesus given for the forgiveness of sins. God, may we experience this bread and this cup May we experience this in a way that would remind us as we do it right now, as we think about it later, later, as we anticipate it in the weeks and months and years to come, when we think of the body and blood of Jesus, may we be further confirmed and encouraged that you are a good God who gives good gifts. That you do not withhold from us, that you do not tempt us, that you give us what is good, even trials, as you desire to take us home to be with you. Remind us of that now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.